Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazor Train, we'll take a first look at Microsoft Blazor, its history, and how it evolved as a product and became part of ASP.NET Core. We'll look at how the Blazor component model simplifies common tasks like binding and event handling. I'll write a simple demo to illustrate the power of Blazor and how it can make you a more productive web developer. That's all happening right now, right here on Blazor Train. Blazor Train! Blazor is an open source web user interface framework for building single page applications, or SPAs, using HTML, CSS, and C Sharp. You can interact with JavaScript if you need to, but the majority of your UI code can be C Sharp all the way. As with JavaScript UI frameworks like Knockout, Angular, Vue, and React, Blazor bridges the gap between application logic and user interface. It has support for binding, eventing, and much, much more. Blazor comes in two flavors, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. Simply put, Blazor Server apps run on a server, and Blazor WebAssembly apps run in the browser. In the next episode, I'll go into detail about how they actually work and the differences between them. But first, a little history. Blazor is the brainchild of Steve Sanderson, a developer on the ASP.NET team at Microsoft. You know, in 2010, Steve developed Knockout, one of the first really successful JavaScript UI frameworks. But around 2015, Steve was paying attention to an initiative called WebAssembly, or WASM, W-A-S-M, which promised to be a standard cross-platform virtual machine for modern browsers, allowing languages other than JavaScript to run inside the browser, but having the same security restrictions as JavaScript. Naturally, he was looking for a way to allow .NET developers to write web apps with C Sharp. In March 2017, four major browsers, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and WebKit, came to a consensus that WebAssembly was ready for prime time. Later that year, in June, Steve famously did a talk at the Norwegian Developers Conference in Oslo, where he showed a prototype of Blazor running C Sharp in the browser, and everyone went nuts. For this prototype, Steve needed a .NET runtime built for WebAssembly. He found an abandoned GitHub project called .NET Anywhere, written in C. He was able to compile the source code into WebAssembly with a compiler called mscripten. Once there was a runtime, he could load .NET assemblies in the browser so long as they used supported APIs. Later on, Blazor would use a lightweight mono runtime, and it still does. The current version of Blazor WebAssembly supports any .NET Standard 2 assemblies. Now, if you're not familiar with .NET, that last paragraph might have sounded like blah, 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 blah. Well, don't worry about it. All you need to know is that Blazor WebAssembly makes it possible for you to run C Sharp in the browser, and that, my friends, is up. Woo, woo! Earlier, I said that WASM code runs with the same security restrictions as JavaScript. Actually, WASM is even more locked down than JavaScript is. You can't interact with the DOM directly and you can't interact with any arbitrary JavaScript. The only thing you can do is send messages to your own JavaScript handler, and from there you can do whatever you want. Fortunately, Blazor has done all the work for you. You can just concentrate on your c -sharp UI code. Again, can I get a woo, woo? Firefox and Chrome browsers currently support the WASM format on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and Android. The latest versions of Edge and Safari also include WASM support. Browsers that don't support WASM directly can still run WASM code. WASM is just a subset of the things any normal browser can do, so it's not hard to create a polyfill to support WASM. Mscripten, the same tool that Steve used to compile WASM binaries, can also produce asm.js a strict subset of JavaScript that can be used as a low-level, efficient target language for compilers. But in 2018, support for asm.js was removed from Blazor. 
meaning that any browser such as Internet Explorer 11 that doesn't explicitly support WASM binaries can't run Blazor. As of today, that's still the case. IE 11 does not support WebAssembly, and that is that. As early as February 2018, the ASP.NET team had established their intent to build out a new component model that combined the composition features of Razor with the power of WebAssembly. The name Blazor actually is a portmanteau between Browser and Razor. It's Razor in the browser, with an L thrown in there, Blazor. This new component model would include all the bits that a, a Blazor SPA framework required. This includes composable UI, routing, layouts, forms and validation, dependency injection, JavaScript interop, live reloading in the browser during development, server-side rendering, full .NET debugging in both the browser and in the IDE, rich IntelliSense and tooling, and publishing and app size trimming. Today, the Blazor component model allows you to combine HTML, markup, C Sharp, JavaScript, and CSS, compile it all to an assembly, and share it across projects. In doing so, Microsoft has created a new market for third party Blazor components. DevExpress, my sponsor for Blazor Train, whoa, whoa. is one such company building components for Blazor. As I mentioned in the introduction, there are two flavors of Blazor, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. Without a robust component model, Blazor Server wouldn't exist. In the next episode, I'll go into detail about the differences between these two flavors. They're actually called hosting models because of the different environments in which the code is hosted. Even though Blazor started as a WASM project, Blazor Server was actually released first. It was introduced in July 2018, and it ran on .NET Core 2.1 and in Visual Studio 2017. So many people were excited about Blazor. The blogosphere was rife with Blazor posts. Stack Overflow lit up, and soon there were code snippets everywhere. Then, breaking changes were introduced in .NET Core 3.0 Preview 8 which was released in August 2019. And these changes made it difficult for newcomers to find answers to common programming questions online because much of the existing code base didn't work anymore. Fortunately, the documentation was, and still is, excellent. And most people can find all the answers they need in the docs. And now I'm over here. All right, I promised you a demo, here it goes. We got Visual Studio 19. This is the latest preview version, but it doesn't really matter. A Blazor app is a Blazor app. We're gonna create a new one, and uh, I'm gonna call it First Blazor App. I don't know, just came to me. Um, there is something weird here with the latest preview of Visual Studio 2019, and I'm recording this uh, in May, mid-May. So if you have the WebAssembly template installed and you don't see it here, you go up to .NET 3.0 and then back to .NET 3.1 and there you'll see it. But we're not gonna build a WebAssembly app today. We're gonna build a Blazor server app. When we build a, an application, a Blazor server application or a Blazor WebAssembly app, we get this sort of demo built in. And just you know by running this application, you can already do a couple of things. There's three pages, essentially. There's a, a static page that just has some text. And then there's a counter page. And then there's a fetch data page. So here's the home page. Hello world, welcome to your new app. Uh, and then we have counter. And you can also see, if you look up in the URL, that we're navigating to a route uh, called counter. So this doesn't load up an ASPX page or anything. This is a single page application. So there's really only one page. But depending on the route, you know, that will load up a component in place. You know, a component uh, in this case is a page. So here's our fetch data, which goes and gets some random data from a service. Let's take a look at counter because this is the canonical Blazor demo application. 
Uh, you click a button and a number increments on the screen, right? So this is like your typical Ajax style call where you click a button in the browser, some magic happens. Of course, you know, it's usually an HTTP request and then an HTTP response comes back. Uh, and then in some JavaScript, you update the UI. It's not how it happens in Blazor, uh, in Blazor server or Blazor client actually. But in Blazor server, it's more like a traditional uh, HTML application because the browser and the code are in different places. The code is running on the server, right? The browser obviously has code in there, but it's not your code. So let's take a look, a little closer look at counter. And over here, you can see under pages, I've got counter.razor. So counter.razor, very simply, at the very top, we have this at page directive, which says this is a page, all right? Every page is also a component, but a component isn't necessarily a page. So here we just have some regular HTML and a button. All the code is in this at code block. Yes, you can move the code to a class. We'll do that later. But look at what we have here. We have an integer current count that we're displaying with the razor syntax at current count. And if you've done any CS HTML pages, any razor pages, you'll, you'll recognize this sort of pattern. All right, check out the button click on click event usually you wouldn't see an at here and the at uh, signifies that this is a server-side method instead of um, a javascript method right if we take out the at that is saying okay i want to call this javascript method called increment count but in blazor land if we put an at sign in there now this is going to call a method on the server and that method increments current count and then it gets redisplayed uh, in the browser. So all of this stuff happens magically and in the next episode I'm going to go into detail about how it actually works and we'll actually watch it working. But suffice it to say for now it's very very efficient. Okay. Um, there isn't view state going back and forth. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, state information like you would have in web forms. It's very very efficient and you'll see just a number of bytes get sent back and forth but you don't have to do it that's the most important thing you need to know right now it just works and it just happens all right so let's take over our index page here i'm gonna open up index and it says hello world welcome to your new app there's a survey prompt um this is a good uh thing to take a look at survey prompt so this is a component and you'll see that a component has, uh, here it is right here, survey prompt under shared. Um, a component that isn't a page has markup and it has code, but it doesn't have that at page directive, but it's still a component. So you can see it has a, a title and that title property is specified as a parameter. And parameters essentially are members that get exposed outside uh, in the caller or in the in the parent component as you will you know whatever is instantiating that in this case it's index and then you can specify those parameters declaratively when you instantiate it right so survey prompt title equals how is blazer working for you so that's just a very simple uh, component now I'm gonna delete this and I've got some code here. Let's make a code block. And I'm going to start with a person class. Very simple. It has an ID and it has a name. And next, I'm going to instantiate, or I'm not going to instantiate, but I'm going to define a list of person called people. Okay? Next, we're going to create some people. I'm going to create some person objects and add them to people. First thing we're going to do is, and you might notice this, protected override void uninitialized. So uninitialized is a virtual method in the component model that you can override 
to get control the first time it instantiates, right when it in is initialized, like your page load in web forms, let's say. So, and I know there's more to it. We'll get into more detail later. Um, so basically we're creating, we're instantiating the list right there and we're adding some people, Carl, Kelly, Emmy, Clara. Oh, and I notice I've got a, a bug here. So I'll just change that. Let's change the IDs so that they're in the right order. Okay, very good. Um, next, let's add some markup. So up here, we're gonna do some conditional markup. So look at this. If people does not equal null, and let's face it, it could equal null if the component hasn't loaded yet, you know, if this particular code right here in uninitialize hasn't executed yet, and we don't have a new list of person. This is the default right here, it's null. So if it's not null, we're going to display a, a list box. And you can create a list box in HTML by with a select element. Select size equals four means it will only be four items deep. And we're gonna set it to 100% width of whatever container it's in. And then essentially we have, uh, we're looping through all of the person objects in people. And we're saying, or setting an option here in the list box, value equals at person dot ID to string. That's the value. So, you know, in a list box, no matter what platform you on, you have uh, a value that is identifies what the object is in the list and then whatever you want to display. So that's what we're doing here. We're displaying person name. The value is person ID. Not very interesting yet, but I wanted to show you that conditional UI that you can actually control what gets displayed based on code. So there it is. Just a list box. Now, let's make it more interesting and let's do something when an item is selected in the list. So, the next thing that we're going to do is add this person object, selected person. And we have a, a method called item selected, which we'll wire up in a second. And this accepts a change event args object. Okay, so that has the value of the option, right? And we're all, it's also a string, so we need to convert that to an int 32. This is what we're doing. We're getting the selected person by pulling it out of the people uh, collection based on the ID being an integer version of the value of this guy right there. So let's change the markup here. So this is a little bit more in depth. So if the people doesn't equal null, which we have, we're gonna put a header here, people. And now we have a select at on change equals item selected. So this happens item selected whenever you click on an item in that list box. And then everything else is the same here, but take a look at this. If selected person does not equal null, and it's going to until you click on something, then we have this little div below that says the selected person and their name. And there you go. Hey, can I get a woo woo? All right, Carl, back to you in the Blazer Train Studio. So now you know what Blazor is, how it was conceived and productized, and you've had a glimpse of how to write a Blazor app. Woo! Woo! In the next episode, we'll dive into Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly and discover the differences and similarities between them. We'll also discuss the pros and cons of each model so you can make an informed decision as to which model will be best for your Blazor application. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train!